Hey church family, welcome to the Father's House, Orange County. We are so glad that you decided to join with us today. My name is Matt Oltoff, and here's what we need you to do. We need you to grab your Bibles, your pens, your notebooks, and man, get ready for a powerful message of what God's gonna do. And here's the thing, I believe there's some people in your life right now that probably need this message. Text them, DM them, send them an email, whatever it needs to do, that you need to invite them to be a part of what God is doing today. Thank you and enjoy the message. Thank you that you care about your people. Thank you, God, that you will turn your loving eye to your people, that you incline your loving ear to your sons and daughters, that you are turning your heart to those who need you today. We honor you, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. We glorify you in this space. In the mighty name of Jesus, God's people say amen and amen. Can we thank God? If you're wondering why we clap, we clap because he's good. We clap because he's mighty and he is faithful. That's why we clap. All right, y'all can... Go ahead and grab a seat. I think I say this every Sunday, but I really do mean it. You picked a good day to be in the house of God today, okay? I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding because today is a sacred day. And the day, the the topic we're going to talk about today, it requires a big amount of faith. A big amount of faith. And as we have dived into the book of Mark, actually it's dove. As we've dove, divin? Dove, dove, dove. As we've been reading the book of Mark over the last couple of weeks, we are in a series entitled Marked. And um, I have been so excited to see people go through the book as part of their homework. Now, if you're visiting or you're new and you're like, we had homework, don't worry about it. It's all good. Uh, for our Bible scholars and students in the house, do not lie in the house of God. You guys, I asked for at the beginning of the series, I said, give me five minutes for five days a week. That's it. And you want to know something? You could read the entire chapter in just five minutes. So even if you did your homework one day, you still will be caught up. So loving saints in the house. House. Do not lie. By a show of hands, and please show up first service because they showed up really well. Those are the real Christians. But um, by a show of hands, how many did your homework by reading Mark chapter 5? Okay, second service is showing up. All right, I'm here for it. Well, don't worry. If you didn't do your homework, you can do it for next week. Next week, we're going to be in Mark chapter 6, and the homework is reading Mark chapter 6 this week. But as we've gone through Mark chapter 5, um, I love music. I feel like I can be talking to people or have an experience and I hear a soundtrack. In fact, I'll be on dates with Matt and we'll be having a great conversation or maybe a heated moment of conversation or something and I'll hear a track and I'm like, oh, do you hear that song? And he's like, what do you hear? I hear music all the time, friends, all the time. And I feel like sometimes we need like soundtracks for life. So I have in my Apple iTunes account, I have um, my Jesus Jams with a Z. And then I got my Holy Spirit jams with a Z because that's when I feel real, like, holy. And then I had some save a sister jams because those are the ones that I need for my workout. You know, like, I, you, I might not be saved with this music track, okay? So I have soundtracks for various needs of my life. And um, there's this one song that I feel like if it can be a track for today's message. I believe that it doesn't matter what ethnicity you are, what color you are, or even how old you are. Because this song was written, and I wasn't even born yet. But it is played at weddings and at sporting events. And this one famous TikToker who I love, he goes around and he sings just various lyrics of songs. And every single person, when he sings a lyric, they could finish it. Uh, I remember being at my friend's wedding and I was so happy for her. She found her life mate. She found her lobster. She found her swan. She found the person that she was going to be with the rest of her life. And I was so happy for her. But yeah, I was so sad for me. On the dance floor, she is dancing with the love of her life. And this song, by Journey, comes on. And the lyrics belt out, and the chorus is there. And, it's, and the, the lyrics say, don't stop believing. And I'm looking at them with tears streaming down my eyes as my singleness. Like, don't stop believing. You can get married, too. You know, I, I just I, th- that song can pluck the heartstrings of many people in here from different generations and even genders. Why? Because it is a song that could speak to our heart. I firmly believe that that could be a track for this message today, okay? Because um, if you are the note-taking type, I want you to jot down the title of today's message, which is Don't Stop Believing. Don't stop believing. Uh, Turn with me in your uh, Bibles to Mark chapter 5. We're going to start in Mark chapter 5, verse 21. Um, If you didn't bring your Bible, it's all all good. I know it's kind of dark up in the high area, but no problem. We have the scriptures on the screen. So I want us to dive into God's word. 
And I, 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 would, I wish I could unpack the entire chapter because there's three amazing stories of healing that take place here. But we only have time for one and a half two today. And so um, I call this a two for text because we get two for the price of one. All right. So Mark chapter 5, verse 21. It begins with this. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came. And when he saw Jesus, he what, church? Mm -hmm. I want you to say it like you know the answer because it's on the screen. I'm going to do that again. When he saw Jesus, he, I want you to circle that in your Bible if you brought your Bible with you. Verse 23, he pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman that was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. I want you to underline that phrase, touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I could touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in, and she felt in her body that she had been freed from her suffering. At once, verse 30, Jesus realized the power had gone out from him. He turned around the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? Are you kidding me, Jesus? Are you for real? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and what, church? And circle that in your Bible as well. And trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid. Just believe. Somebody say, just believe. Again, the title of today's message is Don't Start Believing. Don't stop believing. So, <laughs> Bless my heart, okay? Just bless it. Don't. Don't stop believing. Now, I don't want you to think it's strange that in Mark chapter 5, um, he starts off with a man by the name of Jairus uh, and then sandwiches a story in there, the point five of the 1.5. He sandwiches another story in there with a woman with an issue of blood. Now, um, I have taught out of uh, this text about Jairus and his daughter, and I've taught another study about this one with the issue of blood. But as I have been preparing for this message, I realized what a grave injustice I have done to this narrative to separate those two stories because, y'all, they are interconnected. They are interconnected. It's this beautiful um, interplay. Now, at the surface, on the surface, they don't look like there's anything connected about them at all, in fact. It, so what I like to do when I study the Bible is, what are the discrepancies? What are the differences? Well, let's just list some that we see in the text. Well, Jairus is a man. And this woman is a woman. Jairus, his name is listed. She's, her name is not listed. Jairus was honored and redeemed and respected. And yet this woman was shamed and shunned in her community. He was a ruler in the synagogue. He was basically like a pastor, someone influential in the spiritual community. And yet she hadn't been to synagogue in most likely over 12 years. Jairus was influential and affluential. And this woman was broke and busted because she spent so much of her money on cures and going to doctors that didn't help her. They seemingly have nothing in common at the surface. But you know life. It will take a position, a place, and a posture. And take two people that do not go together and bring them together. And what is the same posture that we find Jairus and this woman in? They fell at the feet of Jesus. Yes, Bible scholar. Yes. They fell at the feet of Jesus. Now, in this account, um, their miracles are moving together. Their testimonies are going to be intertwined. And whether you like it or not, guess what, friends? We are deeply connected as a church body and as humanity. It, it, it's the truth. Um, in fact, if you participate in this community or you're part of the online community, all of our lives interse intersect. 
Now, I know that you've mentioned, heard this mentioned a couple times, but community groups, if you're new to church, community groups are basically a place midweek where we can gather because we don't believe that church is just on Sundays in these four walls. You are the church. And so we create intentional communities online and in person where people can get to know each other. Here's the misnomer, though. When people hear community groups, they think, I'm going to sign up. My life is going to be great. I'm going to lose 10 pounds. I'm going to inherit 12 automatic BFFs. That's not community groups, friends, okay? The truth of the matter is, is that you're taking different people from different perspectives and bringing them together. Why? To sharpen as iron sharpens iron. That doesn't mean you're going to fall in love with somebody in the group or you're going to find your best friends. It means that you're putting people in your life that maybe you otherwise wouldn't connect with. But you're going to open up God's word together. You're going to pray together. You're going to stand in faith and believe together. That's the power of, our, of the community groups. And in some cases... Relationships do happen, glory to God, and best friends actually do occur. Now, that's, that's, that may not be the norm, but what I'm saying is when God's people come together, we realize our stories interconnect. Look at verse 23. He pleaded earnestly with him. Now, when we read the Bible, sometimes I fear that we don't get the depth. So I want you to see Jairus. I want you to see a desperate daddy who is going to Jesus. Now, Jesus was the ostracized one of the religious community. The Pharisees and the religious folk, they didn't like Jesus. People in the synagogue wouldn't want to associate with Jesus. And yet Jairus puts all of that aside because he is a desperate dad looking for someone to heal his daughter. Can you imagine if he heard that Jesus was coming into town? He would have been breathless. He would have sprinted over to Jesus and say, Jesus, Jesus, please, please come. My daughter is ill. Please come to my house. Isn't it crazy? He said, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she may be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. Isn't life the greatest equalizer? Because Jairus is a man of influence and affluence. He is bougie. He is bad and bougie. And yet this other woman is broken, busted. And yet we see you could have social influence but still need a miracle. You could have all the degrees in the world and still need a miracle. You could be married to the perfect spouse and have amazing kids, but it can't fix your issues. You can have all the power, but it can't make you be whole and heal. There's going to be moments in life. Like Jairus, where we say, Jesus, I can't do this, but I need you to. I have tried everything that I could, but I need a miracle. I need you. Look at verse 25. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for how many years? She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had. And yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I could just touch his clothes, I will be healed. What do you do when you are so close to an answered prayer? What do you do when you're waiting for your miracle? How will you respond? Don't stop believing. Now, you might judge me for this. I'm okay with that. I believe that there's certain times in life where we've got to push past to get into the presence of God because we need a miracle. And people are like, oh, that's a little selfish. I'm not too sure it is because we see this here. We see Jairus and we see a woman both pushing past people to get into the presence of God. Why? Because he was their only hope. Uh, have you been there, church? Because I have. Where I am so desperate, I've got to get into the presence of God. I've got to know that he hears me. i got to know that he can touch my life. And I, it might sound savage, and I get it. But sometimes, desperate times, call for, boop, boop, flip it and reverse it. Desperate, desperate times call for, I don't know how to say it, brother. Desperate times. Call for desperate measures. There we go. We got it. We got it. Desperate times call for desperate measures. And I know this because um, I was in an Atlanta airport a couple years ago. A really big storm. It felt like 81,733 flights had been canceled on that day. I had been stuck at the airport for a number of hours. We were a, a young church plant. We were only one year old. And I was teaching on that Sunday, and it was a Saturday. I had to get back. Well, they were rerouting flights, and they were like, okay, you're not going to fly into Orange County. You have to fly into L.A. You can get transportation. Boop, boop, boop. I was like, whatever. Just get me back home. And so they said, well, you're going to wait in this line. And when they opened up the gates, we have 17 seats on that flight. Well, I had been waiting in this line for two hours. I was about four or five people in. 
Well, pretty soon as the time got closer and closer to opening up the gate for people to register for these only 17 seats, people started sneaking in line and cutting in line and bringing their family members into the line. Now, I'm a saved, sanctified woman of God. I, I'm very saintly. But at some point, you got to kind of stand for justice. So I was lovely. I was lovely. I said, hey, excuse me, excuse me. Um, so we've been waiting in line for about two hours. And so the line's right behind us, right, right back over here. There's only 17 spots, so we, we have to stay in order. These jokers acted like they didn't speak English. Undeterred, undeterred by their shade, I said, I'm blessing less because I can come at you in Spanish, okay? <laughs> Oh, no, absolutely. Parlare inglese, because I can come at you in Italian. Ego ka wakarimasu I can come at you in Japanese. Hello, okay? And they kept on ignoring me. Then they started getting rude. So I was like, Jesus, take the wheel, because, you know, I, I got to be saved today. Well, the, the, the gate agent behind the gate started taking people's information, and I was like, there is more than 17 people in this line, and I have got to get on this flight. Now, let me tell you something, friends. I have only done this once, and I pray to God I never have to do it again. But sometimes you need to roll up with some authority in your life, you know? I have flown on Delta. I've been loyal to Delta for a number of years. I'm not sponsored by Delta, but I'd like to be. Hello. Um, <laughs> and so I have accrued some loyalty. In fact, I've accrued, accrued the maximum amount of loyalty with Delta. And so now, 20, 25 people back in this line, I gently call out to the gate agent. I said, e excuse me, sir, as a Delta Diamond member, I just wanted to make sure that I get on this flight because I've been waiting in line and these people are cutting in line. Without even batting an eye, he said, oh, I'm so sorry, ma'am. Come to the front of the line. Let me tell you something. I went from Pastor B to Cardi B real quick, okay? I was like... Excuse me, excuse me, bye. Ah. And I got on the flight because desperate times call for desperate measures. Jairus and this woman had to push to get into the presence of God. Di Jairus was desperate for his daughter to be healed, and this woman was desperate to be touched by Jesus. Now, this woman, because of her issue with blood, hemorrhaging, she would have been ceremoniously unclean. She would have been banished to live outside of the city. She couldn't go to church or fellowship in the synagogue. She most definitely would not have been married, and she most definitely could not have kids. This woman is, is desperate. How many know when you're desperate, you're willing to do desperate things? I will never judge the way that somebody worships. Because unless you're in their position, you don't know what they need. I don't mind if someone gets on the floor and weeps. I don't mind if someone stands up with arms raised begging God. I don't mind if people begin to cry out and believe that God is who he says he is and can do what he says he can do because they're desperate. Have you been there? I've been there. In fact, as I was preparing this message, I said, Lord, this message is for no one but for me because I am crying out, I am desperate. I am desperate for you, God. And I realized when we were at Pursuit Night just this past Wednesday, we hadn't been able to come together and worship as a church for over 17 months. And I realized that Pursuit Night just wasn't for me. Our entire church, the room was desperate for Jesus. It didn't frighten me. It excited me because I believe that desperation is the beginning of God unlocking things in our lives. So you can come to church here in our perfect, frozen, chosen, Orange County culture and be like, everything's fine, everything's perfect, everything's great, I love my life, oh, right. Or you can be honest and be like, I'm desperate. And I need him to do what only he can do because I cannot. The truth of the matter is, is some of us in here won't even admit it because we are embarrassed or we're ashamed or we fear like if people really knew what I was wrestling with, then my facade would be down. But I firmly believe that God will use desperation sometimes to push us into our destiny. That desperation is oftentimes the seed of breakthrough. That desperation is the seed of breakthrough. And we got people showing up once a month, twice, once every two months, and they're like, well, I asked God and he didn't give it to me. Did you go in and were you desperate, friend? Did you just throw up like a Hail Mary, like, oh, down the line, okay, Jesus, if you want to do it. Or did you say, God, I need you to move. I will not move like Jacob unless you bless me. God, I am desperate, D desperate for the crumbs off your table, desperate for a touch, desperate for a look, desperate for a healing, desperate for a breakthrough. Are you desperate, church? Are you desperate? 
R. Parsley said this. He, he's written about this a number of times. There's been songs that have been written off this quote. He said, the atmosphere of expectation is the breeding ground of miracles. Oh, it absolutely is. So in verse 22 and in verse 33, we see um, a powerful person of prominence and a lowly lady in the same position at the feet of Jesus. And we can come here today with all of our differences. I looked around at first service and it was so uh, emotional during worship because we had people from different age groups. We had different people from different colors. We got different people with testimonies like wealthy entrepreneurs and people that are ex-cons all rolling up in here today. And you know, want to know something? That we all come to be at the feet of Jesus. That's what happens when we're desperate. We are staying at the feet of Jesus because Jairus was at the feet of Jesus and this woman was at the feet of Jesus. But here's a detail that I don't want us to miss. For those that read their homework, you might know the answer to this. But scripture we've already read, how long did this woman have an issue of blood? 12 years. She was hemorrhaging for 12 years. Now how old was Jairus' daughter? Huh, that's interesting. Now, why would Mark include these details? Okay, so let's geek out for a second. I know we don't have a whole lot of time, but I'm a word nerd. So go down this trail with me because I believe that God's word will give us little hints, little bites, little amouge bouches of details that add to the power and authority that Mark so desperately wants us to know. Why did he include the age of uh, the woman's illness and the age of the girl? Because 12 is a number worth noting in the Bible. So let's back this up. Let's go Old Testament. Um, Abraham had a son named Isaac, and Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob had sons. Does anyone know how many sons that Jacob had? 12. Good job. Good job. Now, each of these 12 sons each launched a tribe. So how many tribes would be in all of Israel? Very good. Now, in the Old Testament, there was a high priest, and a high priest would have an ephod. And on the ephod, there would be 12 different stones. I ruined that already. How many stones were on the ephod? Good answer, good answer, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, what did it represent? Power and authority. The high priest in the Old Testament wore an ephod to represent power and authority. And yet in the New Testament, we have our high priest, a.k.a. Jesus, who rolls up onto this earth and opens his mouth in the temple to proclaim wisdom that astounded people at what age? 12 years old, and they marveled. Now, when Jesus became 30 and he picked his posse, his clique, his homeboys to roll with him, to do the miraculous, to cast out demons, and to walk and do life with him, how many men did he pick? 12. Why? Because 12 is in biblical numerology the number for power and authority. Mark wants us to understand with clarity and precision that Jesus is a man of power and authority. The moment that Jesus stepped into ministry, as we learned last week, that there is no storm that God does not have power and authority over. We learned in Mark chapter 1, there's no demon that God does not have power and authority over. And we're going to learn today that not even death, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your strength? That not even death will even threaten our God who has power and authority. He's got the power. Amen? Look at verse 29. Immediately. Oh, I, I love Mark. Mark loves that word immediately. He wants you to know. Big bang, boom, baby. It's done. Immediately. Her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from suffering. That's my prayer for the house today. That somebody experience this online and in this room. That you'll be freed from suffering. Now, bear with me because I get so excited about this. But... This is not the only account of this situation, the woman with the issue of blood. In Matthew chapter 9, as your cross-reference, in Matthew chapter 9, uh, Matthew records this. But, you know, Mark is kind of like the meathead that just loves the bullet points. Matthew is a little bit more illustrative. He wants to include some details in there. And in Matthew chapter 9, um, he includes the detail that this woman reached out and touched the hem of his garment. That she touched the hem of his garment and she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. Now, why did both Mark and Matthew list out garments? That seems like an odd detail because in other accounts in all the gospels, people would reach out and touch Jesus, reach out and touch Jesus, reach out and touch Jesus. Or Jesus would reach out and touch him, reach out and touch him, and reach out and touch him. And yet, 
there is this Hebraic detail. Well, what does that mean? It's a detail that only Hebrews would be keenly aware of. And since I'm a good Jew, let me tell you a little bit about the history. I went to Israel when I was 13 years old. I, um, I, I didn't know that I was Jewish at the time. And I felt like I was going to be like have my own like bat mitzvah or something with Jesus. And um, that wasn't the case because I paid for my own trip. Neither here nor there. I learned this fascinating detail. That the word garment that is listed here in Matthew and Mark, if you look at it in its original context, it is the same word that is used in, in, in Malachi 4.2. And that word for garment and the word for garment in Malachi 4.2 can be translated wings. What's fascinating about this? In Psalm 91, it is prophesied that Messiah will have healing in his wings. Matthew includes the detail, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, well, what garment would Jesus be wearing? It's very common in Hasidic and Orthodox communities, even to this day, but definitely back then, to wear a prayer shawl. And it was believed that under the prayer shawl, Messiah would have healing in his wings. So this woman wasn't just reaching out to the garment because she felt like it or that she would be close or he wouldn't notice. This was her believing that this is Mashiach. This is Messiah. This is the one who had been prophesied to come. And if I could just touch the wing, I could find healing in his wings. That detail is important. Why? Why is this important? Because your awareness of his authority will determine how much power you think he has. I'm going to say that again because this is really important for us to understand. That your awareness of his authority will determine how much power you think Jesus possesses. It's important to teach this in context. Otherwise, we make it a text about faith. Which is important because Jesus himself said, daughter, we read it, daughter, your faith has made you well. And we tell people you have to have faith. And faith is important. You definitely need faith. Absolutely. But what is your faith connected to? Because if you don't know who he is, how can it change who you are? Which is the, the theme, the topic of this entire series. When you know who he is, it changes who you are. Do you believe that Jesus is just a good teacher? Do you believe that Jesus is a good man? Do you believe that Jesus is nice or that Jesus is healer? Or do you believe that Jesus is and was and will be final authority and possesses all power? Because if you don't believe that he is final authority, your faith is going to struggle. Your faith won't be able to sustain. And sometimes we tell people, oh, you got a faith problem. You have a faith problem. Oh, you need more faith. You need more faith. Do you? Or do you just need an awareness of the authority that Jesus has? Now, um, uh, we spoke about this in, in, in Mark chapter 4 uh, last week. And I want to say, just for those that were here in church yesterday, if you, or last week, if you weren't here last week, no worries, it's on YouTube. But that was one of my favorite passages to ever teach in my life. I felt like there was something fresh on that message. And one of the things that we discovered last week is that the disciples were in the storm of their life. Scripture listed as a hurricane, and they are terrified. And we wanted to re recreate that scene of the fear that would have grip them and they cry out to Jesus who is asleep on a pillow in the stern of the ship and they say Jesus do you not care that we're going to die Jesus gets up goes to the stern of the boat and says peace be still and they were shook they were shocked they do you remember what they said they said who is this that can calm the storms in the sea so they didn't know who Jesus was, and yet this sick, bleeding woman, she knew who he was. If I could just touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. That is Messiah. So maybe you don't have a faith problem, friends. Maybe you have a, a, a lack of an awareness of his authority. Because when you know who he is, it changes who you are. He is the ultimate authority, and we need to be reminded of that. Because many of you guys came in today, and you think, oh, well, my doctor is the final authority, or my boss is the final authority, or my spouse is the final authority, or that person is the final authority, or the person who broke my heart and left me has the final authority. No, 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 no. Jesus is the final authority, and he has power to calm any storm, to silence any demon, and to bring to life those things that are absolutely dead. See, Jairus was aware of his authority. 
Jairus is like, I'm a local man of influence and affluence in this society. I'm a person here of faith, and people know who I am. So me, in my authority, I'm going to go to Jesus and say, Jesus, come to my house and heal my daughter. I'm aware of my authority. <laughs> But this lady, she had a whole other sense of an awareness of his authority. See, she hadn't been to synagogue. She hadn't been to church in almost 12 years. But that didn't matter. She said, Jesus doesn't even need to know who I am. He doesn't even need to know my name. I know who he is, and I know he has authority. And if I could just reach out and touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. This woman had been waiting for 12 years for her healing, and she got a healing that day. Now, her healing is awesome, and one where we can stop and celebrate God right there. Amen. Hallelujah. But let's not forget that this is actually an interruption to something that Jesus was going to do. Who went to Jesus first? Jairus. That's right. Jesus was stopped by this man named J Jairus. And can you imagine when J Jairus finally pushes through the crowd and gets to Jesus and says, Jesus, come to my house. And Jesus says, yes. Jairus is probably so excited. So getting to Jesus, he's like, get out the way, get out the way, get out the way. Then he comes to Jesus and he's like, yes, praise God, literally, Yahweh. Jesus, you're going to come with me to my house. Amen. So he runs back out and he's like, get out the way, get out the way, get out the way. I'm hearing the track of ludicrous. Get out the way. Get out the way. Inevitably, uh, that clip is going to end up on YouTube and people are going to be like, do you know the rest of the lyrics to that song? Yes, ashamedly, I do. And that's what I'm hearing right now because if God can redeem the lyrics of Luda, he can redeem your life too, okay? So Jairus is like, get out the way. Jesus is with me. Jesus is with me. And then he stops. He's like, oh, where's, where's Jesus? He goes back into the crowd. Get out the way. Get out the way. Get out the way. And who does he find? Jesus talking to a woman who's crying on her knees. Are you serious, Jesus? My daughter is ill. Can you please come with me? At verse 30, at once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you asked, who touched me? Jairus is like, Jesus, this is an emergency. My daughter, my daughter is dying. I can't wait. Isn't it frustrating when God makes you wait? Not only did he have to wait, he had to wait for this woman to get her miracle. Isn't it frustrating not just to wait on a miracle, but to wait for a miracle and watch someone else get their miracle? that you so desperately are still waiting for, for yours. If you and your spouse have been praying to get pregnant, it's been years and you did it right. And you're experiencing infertility. And yet your cousin, who's not even married and sleeping with him, them, and all the, all the other stuff, she got pregnant? Laura, I've been saving my pennies. I've been saving my pennies. I've been doing Dave Ramsey and I'm living on white envelopes and I'm saving all my money. And I'm going to buy a house one day. And then someone stumbles into like a trust fund and then they get a house and you're like, are you for real? Or the guy that just started working at your business six months ago, he gets a promotion and you're passed up for the job that you were believing for? I went to college with a girl from the South and she taught me, now whenever you feel real jealous, you don't want to let people know you feel jealous. So this is what you say. You say, isn't that great? <laughs> and you have to drag out the gray so it sounds sincere. So if Jairus was a southern woman, he's looking at this situation like, isn't this great? Okay, hurry up, Jesus. We got to go. This is an emergency. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. No. Now, God will oftentimes allow us to watch the miracle of someone else, not to torment us, but to raise our level of faith that if God can do it for them, he could do it for me. That's real easy for us to say, and that's a real holy hallelujah right now. Like, yes, if God could do it for me, he could do it for you. If God can do it for you, he can do it for me. But there is a lie that's attached to this that I want us to be aware of. I want us to align our, uh, our theology. Because what happens is, yes, if God blessed them, God can bless you too. And oftentimes we say, if God did it for you, he could do it for me. And we think it's going to be the exact same way. If God gives you a Tesla, I can't wait for my Tesla to come. If God gives you a man with, a, you know, debt free and 6'4", one green eye, one blue eye, straight teeth, no halitosis, guess what? Oh, then he has one for you too. But the truth of the matter is, is Jairus and this woman, they both wanted the same thing, which was healing. Jairus didn't get a healing. Jairus got a resurrection. 
Now that sounds good. I want resurrection in my life, Lord. Yes, raised to life, those things that are dead. But the prerequisite for resurrection is death. So God is about to do what he's going to do. Because if God did it for her, he can do it for him. It's just going to look a little bit different. Look at verse 35. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and said, your daughter is dead. <laughs> Why bother the teacher anymore? You know who doesn't know the power and authority of Jesus? Jairus' jacked up friends, okay? Because if Jairus' friends knew that he was in the presence with the way maker, miracle worker, they would have said something different. They would have ran up to Jairus. Jairus, okay, baby girl is dead, but don't worry, because you're in the presence of Jesus. And when you're in the presence of Jesus, he's a miracle worker, he's a way maker. Hallelujah, I can't wait to get in the presence of Jesus, because Jesus is going to bring your daughter back to life. But they didn't say that. They said, don't even, don't even bother. No. Don't, don't even bother. Jairus must have been a ball of emotions at this time. He must be looking at Jesus confused like, we were so close. You could have healed my daughter. What is going on? And yet Jesus now steps in and speaks in verse 36. He told him, do not be afraid. Just believe. Now, instead of Jairus saying, Jesus, come, come to my daughter. Now it's Jesus saying, Jairus, come on, baby. Don't be afraid. You just got to believe. You just got to believe. You just got to believe. Look at verse 38. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. During this time in Aryan culture, mourning was something that you could hire. You could hire people that would lament on your behalf. And it was a show. And Jesus... He went and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. Verse 40 says, but they laughed at him. They. Who's they? They is the negative, doubting, disbelieving folk. The same people that when you tell them your dream, when you tell them your need, when you tell them your breakthrough, when you tell them your desperation, they laugh at you. You think God cares about that? How long have you been asking God for that? Is he really going to come through? Get a new problem. Get a new dream. You know what we see Jesus do? He kicks them out. You don't need those people in your life. Look at verse, continue on the verse. He said, after he put them all out, he said, uh-uh, you booted, baby. Bye. I don't want you in here. You're gone. He took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in. To where the child was. Jesus is kind and caring and compassionate, but Jesus is a gangster. He is not going to let people with a lack of faith be in a place that he's about to do miraculous. I think that's a word for somebody in here. You keep on believing for something to get up, but there's other people that need to get out so that your miracle can get up. You need to stop hanging around people that are not going to breathe life and faith and hope into the miracle that you're asking God for. Look at verse 41. He took her by the hand and he said to her, Talitha Ka'um, which means little girl, or a better translation, little lamb. Our good shepherd is speaking to this 12-year-old girl and he says, little lamb, I tell you to get up immediately. There's that love, word that Mark loves. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12. Somebody say 12. She was 12 years old to demonstrate what, church? power and authority at this they were completely astonished what if the power of the miracle wasn't the miracle in and of itself but rather the atmosphere and environment that surrounded the miracle maybe you're in a season right now where today you're doing inventory and you're saying who is in my life that is not going to be speaking life over this dream but as people are exiting out, I need you to usher in Jesus. Because Jesus has power and authority to do what we cannot do. And so I started this message today and I said that we're gonna begin with the end in mind, that we were gonna believe and not just preach about something, but that we were gonna practice something. You know what that something is? It's faith for the impossible. It's faith for the miraculous. Scripture is very clear that God wants to touch his children that God cares about his people. He cares about you. He cares about your problems. He cares about your issues. He really does. 
And we want to be a house that believes that God is who he says that he is and he could do what he says that he can do. And we have a team of people that want to pray with you, want to stand with you, like the disciples who were with Jesus, to stand in faith for a girl to experience breakthrough and healing. That's what we're doing today. Our prayer team has been praying and fasting and believing because some of y'all need to stand with people in this season. People of faith that are gonna believe and whisper the same words, little lamb, I tell you to get up. And video experience two, for those that are in this building and in video experience one, if you exit out this door directly on the, on the left, you'll see a sign, there'll be people to instruct you, but we're gonna practice what we just preached. We believe that God's hand is big and mighty and can move mountains. And so in our old venue, we had space for people to come forward and pray. And we don't have that space here, but God gave us so much space. There's a whole other auditorium. And so this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray for those that need miraculous healing. But before we do, I'm inviting those who have never experienced Jesus in their life. For those that have never experienced Jesus as their Lord and Savior, or maybe those that have at one point been walking with the Lord, but you have since turned. You've walked away. You did a U-turn away from God. Today is your opportunity to come back. And if you've never said yes to Jesus, or you've walked away and you know you need to come back, today is the day of salvation. Online, in this room, in Video Experience One. If you are ready to come back in a right relationship with Jesus, we want to walk this journey with you. You're not alone in that. I'm going to invite those who have never said yes to Jesus into praying a prayer of faith, a declaration of faith that you want Jesus. And I'm going to count to three, and by three, you're going to raise your hand. But if you're saying yes to Jesus, but one, by raising your hand, you are saying, I believe that Jesus is Lord, and I want him to be my Savior. Two, by raising your hand, you are saying, my mistakes and my failures. The Bible refers to that as sin, that your sin can be washed away because of what Jesus has done for you. And three, the same power that resurrected Jesus from the grave is alive and lives in you. So if that's you, you are saying yes to Jesus, or you're coming back to faith. This is for you in this room, online, in the video experience. One, two, three. If that's you, every head lifted, every eye open, will you raise your hand? You are saying yes to Jesus. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? Lift a high. God bless you. God bless you. Yes. <laughs> Y'all, we're celebrating people experiencing eternal destiny. The angels in heaven are rejoicing because sons and daughters are coming back. The little lost lambs are coming back to the shepherd. That's what we're celebrating. We're gonna pray a prayer of faith with those that raise their hands and even in the video experience, I cannot see, but there's someone there who sees your hand. Most importantly, Jesus is acknowledging this decision. So can we pray a prayer of faith and then we're gonna practice what we preach. So for those that said yes to Jesus and everyone in the room to let them know that they're not making this decision alone, will you repeat after me? Can you all say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today I choose you as my Lord and Savior. Cleanse my heart, cleanse my mind, cleanse my conscience. Fill me with your spirit to do what I cannot do. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Can we celebrate people stepping into their destiny? Absolutely. So friends, I'm gonna invite all of us to stand to our feet, and I get it, the rows are a little bit tight, I don't care. Are you desperate, friends? Are you desperate? I need some desperate people in the house if you need prayer, if you want to be anointed with oil, which is symbolic of the Holy Spirit, we have a prayer team ready for you. So right where you are, get out of your row and head out. We have people praying for you. Yes, I see people moving all up in there. I see people moving on this side. Do you need prayer today? We've got a whole team of people in first service. Half the auditorium went out. We got people because we believe. We believe. We believe. I believe that Jesus is the final authority. And even if you can't believe right now, there's a mantle of faith on my life that I will bust open doors because desperate people will open up doors that lackluster faithless people are fine to keep shut. I feel it's high time we need to open up those doors and y'all run through. What do you need, child of God? I serve a God who is looking for people who are saying, I need you, I need you. I need to touch the hem of your garment. I need you to intercede for somebody I love. But people of God, are you ready to get what you need? This is what I want. If you're staying in this room, I need your faith. 
I need your faith. As all these people are exiting out to get prayer, will you stay here? Will you worship God? Will you intercede? Will you believe for our brothers and sisters that we get to witness life transforming testimonies? If that's you, I want you to open your mouth and declare the goodness of God. We praise you, God. We honor you. Will you do what only you can do in this house? In Jesus' name. Hey, Father's House, thank you so much for joining with us today. And, and here's the thing. We are passionate about you taking your next step. And we'd love for you to join in what God is doing here in the house. And so go ahead and click the link in the box. And we'd love to help you take your next step about how you can get involved in the Father's House. And if you would love to partner with us, man, we are believing God is going to do incredible things. And your generosity, as you partner with us, we get to take this message. And so many lives around the world are changed because of your generosity. And so we are excited to partner with you in that. And we can't wait to see what God is going to do. And we hope to see you next week.